20 past 7. Friday morning, Mark Fuller phoned me from Kariha. A year ago, I had a call from Mark Fuller telling me that his rhino had been poached. This time, when he told me that it had more poached rhino, I um, immediately, for a, two or three seconds, I didn't think it was actually real. My response to him was, when do you need me there? Are the police going to be doing their work? It was the usual poached rhino, obviously they're dead scenario. He said, it's alive. But you can never be prepared for what you come across with an animal like this. And I, and I see lots of traumatized animals. I see lots of animal on animal injuries. I see lots of um, blood and, and, you know, pretty desperate situations with animals. But when you know that there's a, there's a human reasoning, some type of reasoning that you can't comprehend behind it all, um, you know, as you approach these things, you just wonder to yourself, what am I going to find and how is my understanding going to affect the way I, I deal with the situation? And when I saw him, I just thought, wow, he must be in such agony. How is he going to respond to me? Um, and what is his capacity to try and inflict some level of revenge or recourse on a human, the first human that comes across this path. Um, when I saw the pool of blood that he'd been lying in, um, the, the blood sprayed all over the tree and the grass, um, it's just a very surreal scene to come across. On the one side there were beautiful plumbago flowers, um, gorgeous green grass and just a tranquil, beautiful, natural scene. I've known from previous experience that one of the worst things that can happen to these animals is that they down for a long time and the pressure on their limbs causes permanent damage to muscles and tissues and nerves and things. And when I saw how he was struggling to get up, I just thought we, we're going to lose this one. And as I approached him, uh, he started to, to try and, when, I wasn't sure in the beginning, but to try and either run away from me or turn to face me. Um, so, and, and at the same time, I was trying to make as little impact on the crime scene as we possibly could. And I, and I was trying to do what I needed to do in a, in a quick and unstressful way as possible. I was hoping to get across to his head and give him some naltrexone intravenously, but that wasn't possible. So we had to give the antidote intramuscular um, in his rump area. And then, yeah, in response to that, he actually, you could see, he, he just built up enough energy to just stumble to his feet and he actually chased me around. Um, and at that point in time, I just thought, yeah, this animal has got every single right to just lose it in a frenzy of mad anger um, and just come and absolutely annihilate us. I mean, he had the ability to do that to me. Um, he could have absolutely trashed the vehicle and the people that were, were 20 yards, 10 yards away from me. Um, and that did go through my mind. I just thought, maybe this guy's going to lose it completely. Maybe he's got the energy and the strength to do that. Um, but sadly, he didn't. And he could only muster five or ten paces before he had to lie down again. Um, and that's the state we left him in. Obviously, there were two animals to think about. So we needed to work as quickly as we could with the first and then move away to the second. Um, and then there was a brief period of five minutes as we moved across, well, moved across to the, the second animal. And um, I remember thinking to myself, well, the second one can't be as bad as this one. And then what can prepare you for the second one? Um, there the female was lying. And my very first impression was 
this animal has got no chance. She was blowing blood-tainted froth out of her nostrils. You could see that by the way she was breathing, she was in severe distress. You could see by the huge pile of blood that had stained the grass and the ground near her head that she'd lost an enormous amount of blood. And uh, there were visible signs of her having struggled through the night. And um, I just thought, surely we can't save this one. Once again, um, we had to try and preserve the, prime, the crime scene. So I maneuvered my way around um, the back of the bush and came in from behind her. And she made no effort to stand up. And that just sort of confirmed my first suspicions that there, there would be no chance for this one. But, you know, we had the antidote, so I thought, well, let's give her a try and, and see if we can get anything right. So uh, with her, I was able to find an ear, raise a vein, and give her the antidote. And then while we were waiting for the antidote to work, I drew up some anti-inflammatory, and we started to administer that. Um, and yeah, to my absolute amazement, and it's still just, it's like a miracle that she started to, she moved, and, and you could see her ears started to flick, and her tail came up, um, and her breathing got deeper. And then I just thought, imagine if this animal does wake up, and is better than we think she is. What is she going to experience when the anesthetic wears off and all that pain-killing property disappears. How is she going to process um, what she's been through, the trauma to her face, she's basically had part of her head amputated. Um, how is she going to try and relate to whatever human smells and my presence how is that all going to be processed in her mind and how is she going to respond to that? And then the agonizing part of, of, of that and just knowing full well that for the first time in her night she was experiencing the full weight of all that pain and all that trauma um, which up to that stage would have been partially numbed by the anesthetic. Yeah, and you know, the amazement of her waking up and then suddenly the reminder that now we've actually got something that is alive, is conscious of all she's going through. She's now mobile and we can't get back to her because she's been reversed. Um, and looking at pieces of flesh hanging from her, from her face and blood running, I just thought, oh man. Have we really even done the right thing here by, by waking her up and, and putting her through the sort of hope of survival and yet there's just such a long way to go still with her. Little did Dr. William Folds realize that this event was to become hugely significant in the fight for survival of the rhino. I think we were all shocked and stunned on this day, March 2nd, 2012. From this point onwards, the focus was on helping these animals deal with their horrific injuries and devise methods to treat their wounds. Having reversed the tranquilizers used on the animals, there had to be a three-day period to allow their bodies to recover before they could be tranquilized again. Three very long and agonizing days. Will Folds was working on a plan to treat the wounds that he had observed. This was going to be groundbreaking veterinary medicine. And before we knew it, day four had arrived. The news of this poaching event had reached the ears of the media, and there was a great deal of interest. Local and international TV crews started to request access to the treatment procedures. Having a medical schedule to work to, and having pre-planned procedures, allows for a certain amount of access. With the tranquilizing of Tandi, the work in assessing her facial damage was crucial to see exactly how to move forwards. 
And having had her moving around in the bush for the previous three days, without any protection for her face and injuries, did present William with a lot of challenges. Her horn had been hacked off below the growth plate, exposing her sinus cavities to the open air. This was not going to be an easy road, but the rangers monitoring her activities in the interim had reported that she was strong and coping as well as could be expected. Uh, having a time now to assess the situation, and, um, and two animals survive, one which looked a lot worse than the other. How do we possibly put together a sensible list of reasons whether they live or they die? Yeah, the female, every time we deal with her, I'm surprised by her behavior. You know, her body by Monday, and it was only three days after this, it looked surprisingly good. We knew she was eating by that stage, we knew she'd been drinking by that stage. And if you looked at everything else besides her face, she actually looked like an animal that had just been through a difficult capture and nothing else. But when we, when we got to her face, you know, after the first anesthetic that we'd given her, to start to treat her, then what I had seen on day one, which I knew was bad, um, once we started removing all the dried blood and getting some of the maggots out and cleaning away bits of grass and mud and pus that had already built up there, you could see the full extent of her injuries. You know, you could also just see how <clears throat> brutal the hacking was. There's no surgery involved. This is just like chopping a block of wood for these guys. Whether they're moving at the time when they're hacking their faces to pieces, I don't know, but they just cuts all over the place. Some of them glance off the bone and slide in under the skin down towards the eye. Um, and I just, when I was working on her face, I just thought this is just so unnecessary because the part of her that they were trying to get is two inches away from where they, they were slashing her. And they went down through well beyond the, the, the horn. They went through the skin, they went below the growth plate, they slashed through. The, um, the bone that the growth plate sits on through the skull below that and right into the, the sinuses. Um, it's just such a mess. And there's just absolutely no regard for, for that animal. Uh, and in three days, unfortunately, what I wasn't expecting was how much. Permission had been granted to dehorn the other member of the crash that Tandi stayed with. The female was tranquilized and her horn was removed by will to lessen her desirability to the poachers. This is a painless procedure. The horn is made of keratin, very similar to your fingernails. We then went on to working with Temba. With his limited mobility, feeling vulnerable, he was staying in thick bush. The helicopter did manage to flush him out for long enough to be tranquilized, but he ran back into the bush, making it difficult to have a clear working area. Um, but you can't help but think to yourself, how much more trauma now are we subjecting this animal to? You know, he's got a body that we knew was really struggling to cope with the amount of dying tissue that was inside of him. His leg had swollen up incredibly, and um, he was really struggling with that pressure and the inflammation that was taking place inside there. Um, his leg was far too painful to, to put weight on it, and while he was becoming anesthetized, um, obviously some of that pain was taken away, and, and he, he was taking weight on that leg as he went down and fell asleep, and you also just wonder you know, are we, are we making things worse? It's something that I don't think about at the time because we've got a job to do and we need to get it done, do the best we can for these animals and then wake them up again. But obviously afterwards you can, you need to try and process what it is that we are trying to achieve by, by, by getting these animals through. 
Over the next couple of weeks, it was decided to monitor the animals and only react to specific situations. There is a lot of trauma and stress related to being tranquilized and worked on, and Will wanted to allow the natural healing processes to take their course. However, reacting to Temba's leg injury, Will decided on day 23 to assess his condition and do some treatments. Temba seemed to be holding his own, but it was pretty obvious that his leg was causing him significant stress. The tough call we've got to make today is whether to euthanize or not. Um, this morning's first report was that he, that he, that he was looking very um, depressed, but having sat with him now for an hour, he's fairly bright. Um, he's brighter than he was yesterday, uh, and I'm actually going to go in on foot now and see if I can challenge him a bit and see if that doesn't um, give me a, a stronger indication of how he's actually feeling. So that's the next sort of... You're going to show me something? Hey, can I come closer? Okay, 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 there we go, there we go, that's good, 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 boy, that's good. That's what we want. That's what we want. That's what we want. Okay, we're gonna leave you. I remember Will calling me early on Sunday morning, day 24, saying that he needed me at Karika urgently, and he gave me the coordinates of where to go. It took me about an hour to get there to be greeted by the scene which will stick in my memory forever. Today has been an absolutely tragic ending to 24 days of struggle. Um, the whole of the Karika team are completely floored by this. That um, such a brave fight should end so tragically. Um, and I know we're all in shock. It's very difficult to comprehend what's happened to our boy Timber, but he's been a magnificent soldier. He's really fought his way through so much. I've just got the most amazing admiration for him. And I feel very humbled to have been part of his life for, for a short while. I'm just so sorry that we couldn't do enough for him. and that we couldn't see him through this. There have been so many people that have, that have done so much to give him the best chance we could. And it's all because of what he had here. I just can't get my head around it. There are so many animals like him that just have some part of them that man, for some reason, thinks they have a right to take and to take under such brutal and merciless ways. How can we stoop so low that we can do this? If I look at his face, you can see real signs of this face healing up. And unfortunately, it wasn't just his face. His main problem here was his leg. And uh, I still don't know, even, even looking at him now, close up with more time, whether that leg would have come right. It's still, it's still an uncertain part of his situation. 
what I do know is because of the fight that he's put up for us. Because he's shown us that you can have this happen to you and you can still survive it. That this boy is going to give us amazing opportunities to save so many other rhino that face the same future. And this boy is going to make He's going to make hundreds of thousands of people determined that this won't happen and that we will stop this thing. And we will find better ways of giving them better chances. But at the root of it all, we need to stop what people across the world are doing to these animals. We simply have to find a way of stopping this, we just have to. We cannot allow rhino every, every single day, sometimes two or three, sometimes eight in a day, to go through this. I feel so broken. So utterly broken that we've we've put him through so much beyond what the poachers did. We've put him through so much, and we haven't succeeded. We haven't been able to give him that life that that he deserves. You need to take the story of Timber, who hasn't made it, and the story of Tundi who will make it and you need to tell the world what these animals are going through the story of the death of timber was very emotional and it was published on the internet by myself. I don't think any of us could have realized the impact that it would have in the international fight against rhino poaching. The clip entitled Day 24 started a tsunami wave of activism. With Tundi being the only remaining survivor and her seemingly to recover well from her major trauma, the focus was on devising appropriate ways to work on her to help her recover as fully as can be expected. With a variety of specialist experts working alongside Will, the battle, while being continuous, was seemingly being won. Then a significant piece of news broke, and it had people screaming with joy. Tundi was pregnant. She was behaving just like a normal rhino, albeit without a horn, which causes issues to do with infections in her facial area. The regrown skin is nowhere near as tough as the original skin and horn, so continual low-level infections were the issue of the day. I took some pictures of her face some 10 months into her pregnancy so Will could check her status. There were some low-level infections, but no cause for alarm. On January 13th, 2015, Tundi gave birth to a baby girl. She was called Tembi in honor of Temba, who died on day 24. I was with Will when he first saw Tembi, when she was 13 days old. He was emotional and I was emotional. I managed to get a few shots with my stills camera before she retreated into the bush. The story of hope and love is a roller coaster of despair and elation. And this film's title is one of those moments of serendipity. A direct translation from Isikosa, the vernacular language in use in the Eastern Cape. The two names, Temba and Tundi, mean hope and love. Tembi is the feminine version of that name. People from around the world make the pilgrimage to Kericha in the Eastern Cape to see Tundi and Tembi. 
The anti-poaching activism has become a much bigger movement, and it is taking on the task of educating people about the myths behind rhino horn and its supposed curative powers which don't exist in any way. For me, the birth of Tembi has also brought hope to the dream that we may win the battle for the survival of this species. Tandi has gone from near death to giving birth. If that doesn't give us hope, then I don't know what will.